Um, so my name is Whitney. Uh, I'm a developer at Superbalist, and uh, I really like drawing, uh, which you're gonna get to see <laughs> throughout this presentation. Um, so we've been using Kubernetes in production for over a year now, and uh, the Kubernetes architecture was, uh, I think, started by Zoidberg, who gave the talk on Linux kernel magic. Uh, so he he's taught us um, a bunch of things. But in any case, um, right, I've got to remember to change slides while I talk. Uh, so this adventure starts in Minikube a long, long time ago, which in tech is only about uh, 10 years. And it's a story of life before containers. Um, so life before containers, it's dependency hell. Uh, there's a delicate in ecosystem of packages that you could ruin e like either internally or um, externally with third party applications. Then there's the, well, it works on my machine thing that you hear from developers, which is particularly annoying. Um, so it's because the software environments are, are not identical. And debugging that kind of thing is time consuming and frustrating. Then there's also the problem of um, traditional virtualization. So traditionalized, uh, traditional virtualization is heavy. Uh, it's quite bleached out. I don't think you can see that quite clearly. But um, there's a Walrus running the hypervisor, um, which is no good because Walruses are, are heavy. Um, and uh, so if you wanted a more uh, understandable diagram of what that is, that's pretty much traditional virtualization, uh, where the hypervisor is an abstraction which allows you to communicate with uh, the underlying hardware, but essentially you've got an operating system uh, with operating systems on top of it. And it's um, expensive and resource intensive, uh, slower, less portable. So this is when uh, container technology was developed by Linux about 10 years ago. And I, I don't know if I made it quite clear, but um, this spaceship is smaller and more compact and more efficient, and uh, that's a kernel fish. So that's a more understandable di diagram of, of OS level virtualization. Um, this is where the entire runtime environment, application de uh, dependencies, and libraries, binaries, configs, all in one package. This makes it um, more lightweight and it talks to the, the underlying OS uh, inter like using namespaces. So by containing all the dependencies, the differences in the OSs and distributions and underlying ar ar architecture are abstracted away. So then came along Docker. So Docker uh, is a great tool. Uh, it's a lightweight application platform that you can use to uh, drop ready-to-run containers into any hardware environment that supports Docker instances, uh, which makes application uh, deployment much easier. So some people think that Docker is like completely synonymous with the container movement, which it's not, but it just provided a whole bunch of really useful tools. So um, one of the great things about Docker is that it has um, like a, a repository of images. There's like a whole community behind um, using, reusing templates for, for the hardware. So uh, we're using Docker to unify your build and test environments across machines and to provide efficient mechanism for deploying applications. Um, it's flexible, so you don't have to make any uh, um, assumptions about the user preferences. It's extendable. Um, you should be able to extend and repackage the environments with your favorite tools. And there's the community approach. So there's also yeah, common tools that you can all work on, which is cool. Um, right, so it saves time. Yay, Docker. So now most of us have decided that using Docker is good, and uh, maybe you've adopted it in your company. But at some point uh, or another, you're going to need to scale. And when you first start scaling, you might just put uh, an application on, a, you know, you might just have like more containers with the same application on each of them. But uh, this is not really a great way of uh, scaling because it's, it's expensive again. And eventually you're gonna have like 40 servers. And then when you're a startup, you're not gonna be able to pay for that kind of you know, 
that's, that's going to be very expensive, potentially. So how are you going to keep track of all the things in your servers? How are you going to get to know like where you, that one Redis uh, services or databases? So this is when you start needing a container orchestration platform. So enter Kubernetes. Oh, well, yeah, there's, that's spaceships. Uh, OK. So um, we started using Kubernetes. Um, that's Zoidberg. Uh, you can't see these so well. Damn. Well, I'll share my, I'll share my slides later, but that's, uh, that's Zoidberg at the helm there. So this is when you start needing Kubernetes, and it's a platform for working with containers. So the key thing about Kubernetes is that um, it helps you with creating deployments. You can pretty much give it a template of all the nice of the things that you want. You know, you get your API, your your database pods. Um, you you create like a set of things, of requirements that you need, and it's really easy to scale those out. Um, it's also really great for monitoring, and because to um, rolling deployments, like you can deploy something and then it'll slowly switch the, the, the code over to, to those, those pods as you need it. Um, so at Superbolist, we, we realized that we, we, we needed to, to switch to a container orchestration system when we had like a monolith of a, of a system and we wanted a more service-driven architecture. Um, so Kubernetes, keep forgetting to change the slides. Um, so this is, Kubernetes is written in Go. So these are some gophers, and they're running um, the Kubernetes master cluster. So it's a collection of processes um, on a single node inside your cluster, which is the dedicated master node. So Kubernetes master knows about other servers uh, you create that you can use containers, you can use to deploy containers to. So um, in Kubernetes, you guys have been hearing a lot about Kubernetes at this conference, but um, there's a couple of basic objects that, that you'll use. Um, and the first is there's a pod, which is a container, and then there's services, volumes, and namespaces. And there's an amazing array of cool things that, that you can do. Um, like one of the things that Zoidberg has helped set up is we have um, personalized stagings. So we just, you know, we have staging with uh, like our main staging, and then it, we've carved off little namespaces for each, each developer which is really useful because our, our uh, staging got really, really full at one stage. Um, so Kubernetes gives you a really powerful tool for accessing the API and dealing with those um, Kubernetes objects, which is kubectl. Uh, Some people say kubectl, which is why it's a cuttlefish. Um, so kubectl, you can check pods, delete them, create deployments, etc. You're basically um, just using it to uh, control the Kubernetes uh, master cluster and do all the things. So um, at Superbolus, we moved from using Vagrant to using Minikube. So Minikube creates a virtual machine uh, that includes Kubernetes and um, a Docker daemon. Um, <laughs> um, it's really handy to reuse Minikube's built-in uh, Docker daemon, as this means you don't have to build a uh, Docker registry on your host machine and push the image into it. You can just build inside the same Docker uh, daemon as Minikube, which speeds up uh, local experiments. So one of the issues that we came across when we were uh, trying to get all of our systems moved into Kubernetes is you get like an error image pool, uh, error image pool um, thing, and you just need to run like an eval Minikube Docker env command. So there's Regardless, um, so what I really liked about switching to Kubernetes was that there's a lot of consistency between the environments. So I'm now able to um, exec into some of the pods on production, and it's exactly the same workflow that I would use on in local. So I've sort of become more DevOpsy as a result, and I feel much more comfortable, um, you know, fixing things in production if I ever needed to. Uh, like if Zoidberg was at conferences all day or something, and I, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's faster and more efficient because I um, I don't have to know all sorts of different systems. I can also look at some of our deploy scripts and understand um, a lot of what's going on in production. The one thing that is slightly scary about it is that it does this so well 
that um, to switch between environments, it's one command. So I continuously have to re, like, like if I'm stressed, I'll have to read the line that switches context like four times because it's just one, one word difference uh, sandbox in the, in the name of the environment variable. Um, but you can pretty easily tell which is which because my, the set of pods for my local is quite different from the set of pods in production. But um, yeah, any case, so 